Hey everyone, thanks for coming this second in person. It's a little, my first in person is a little kind of crazy. Um, I guess I'm supposed to start by asking if there's any business or anything. Not that I can do anything about that. <laughs> about that we ended up being in some hives and out of that came a discussion about what about um, the priority of having um, food sources for our population of uh, native bees and our native pollinators okay so as a plant biologist i think about it for the services that it provides to our, our cultural crops but also just the inherent need to um, maintain preserve and promote our pollinators um, here in Indiana. So <clears throat> this project started uh, last year, and let's see. We didn't test this, did we? Oh, I tested it before. All right. You know what? I think it got bumped off of the the thing here. Okay. So this project. Uh, you know, was developed a couple of years ago, and actually a lot of it um, was conceptualized during um, a forced break in um, my research thanks to COVID. So um, I applied for a USDA grant, um, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. But sort of big picture, um, the area of interest that I have is in um, urban agriculture and what that can look like here in, in Indiana, especially in our neck of the woods here for me in Marion, which is located in Grant County. Now, <clears throat> why even care about urban farming, especially when we can see lots of examples of agriculture happening here uh, in the state, um, primarily through beans and corn, um, sometimes fresh market tomatoes, or um, we live near, our location is near Red Gold, a lot of processing tomatoes. Um, so it's not for the fact that we don't have agriculture happening in the state, very much the opposite, but, Diversified urban farming fits um, other goals. And so I like this triangle. It kind of reminds me of sustainability triangle a little bit. But in one corner of sustainability, another corner of resilience, and the top is multifunctionality. And really, all together, these are promoting social well being, environmental well being, um, and providing food and resources to a community. So um, I think of it in that way that it has these three major uh, drivers in mind that overall this triad can um, improve resilience, sustainability, and multifunctionality. So uh, what does that look like on a small scale or even in Grant County is 
the Indiana Wesleyan before I came in, uh, it's just to give you context, it's a private undergraduate institution, so a PY. Uh, we have 3,000 undergraduates, we have 1,000 graduate students in different programs, none of them in STEM. Actually, that's not true, nursing, so you go PhD. Um, but we actually have 15,000 students worldwide. We have five campuses and a couple of them are international. Um, but we have 3,000 on our main campus and our campus supports two, um, essentially two parts of two gardens that I call our urban farm. So that was here when I came in, one of them now has the bees. And the other thing that Grant County has is they have the Marion Community Garden Association. And this was established um, around 2001, 2002. And there are actually eight locations in Grant County where these are small um, community agriculture uh, locations where people can buy um, or rent a plot in there and maintain it and grow whatever they want uh, for that season. And some of that food is distributed to food banks, some of it is sold, some of it is for personal consumption. So we have these two things happening in Grant County. And really what I saw is the perfect opportunity to meld them together and to be mutualistically beneficial because we're doing something and they're doing something and we're kind of doing the same thing, but with um, different goals. And so what's the common goal we have? One thing that I just noticed from being in this area um, over the years is just not a lot of pollinators, not a lot of bees, not a lot of um, that happening in our urban centers, as well as even on campus, except for wasps who like to follow you all around campus, especially this time of year, which is all the students complain to me about, like I can do something about that. <laughs> anyway, the mission of our Alliance Gardens is what we call ourselves, is to work alongside these community gardens to be able to um, provide food, <clears throat> to provide uh, resources, to provide education, um, and also maybe ultimately help offset food costs in the community um, and, and have fresh resources. Now, we know that in Grant County, it's one of the um, highest, maybe even the number one, most food insecure county in the state. Um, the poverty level is pretty high, especially among um, children under the age of 18. So of course, that's something that I'm really aware of. And we also have a food desert. We don't have a lot of fresh food resources. A lot of our grocery stores are on one side of town and the rest of the side of town where people mostly live, especially have lived there for generations, don't have access because the grocery store is closing and such. So we see the Alliance Garden being able to help provide food um, into um, sort of a depressed area. And um, our food goes that way in three, three ways. One is we donate to our food, um, like our um, Grant County Rescue Mission, um, certain local churches, as well as our food bank. Uh, we sell it at farmer's markets not really for the profit, but really it raises awareness and it puts food out into the community. And then we also have farm boxes. If you think of like those misfit boxes, it's kind of that same idea, although ours are pretty, and, um, but it's a subscription. So you get what you get and you don't get upset. You get the box every week. You can't choose what's in there, it's whatever we have, and you can do it for eight weeks or 10 weeks, whatever you want, and you pick it up on a weekly basis. And those, are, those have been really successful in the last four years even during um, COVID. So like I said, Grant County itself um, houses our university in Marion and it is known for agriculture, primarily corn and soy, as well as manufacturing. But a lot of that has moved away from, uh, well, we still have agriculture. We don't have a lot of manufacturing anymore. Some of our larger uh, manufacturing facilities have left and that has led to sort of a decrease in socioeconomic background and led to quite a disparity and quite a range of socioeconomic backgrounds. And so um, this has led to an increase in poverty rates. And so we're really thinking about this 18%, like we are higher than the average by a bit, um, sorry, um, 31% higher than the 18%. And so we're almost double that um, here in this county. Part of it also has to do with accessibility of food stamps and other aid programs, but um, there, there's a lot of issues going on. And one could be solved or you know, worked upon by having um, more um, food resources. Now, uh, Marion Community Garden Association, they are providing food. They're you know, essentially located kind of along this jaunt. Um, 
<laughs> because of construction and just the way they're laid out. It takes about an hour and a half to get to all of them, interestingly enough, just because of where they're laid out in the city. Um, but they're based in locations that are pretty accessible by the community. You can walk there. And they found that where these community gardens are located, it actually decreases um, uh, incidences of crime by 30%. So that's really exciting too. Now, the challenges that they're seeing and um, have been reported to me, and we can see this in literature, is that um, how do they manage pests, right? If you ever try and grow anything at home, you know something's going to get, right? Some critter is going to come after it and it's going to, if nothing else, make you sad. And so the issue is how do we manage that, um, the pest population and, and do it in a way um, that's sustainable, that isn't causing more impact and more damage. So we, we tend to see exacerbation um, of these uh, pest outbreaks um, by habitat fragmentation and disruption, human impacts, um, increase in urban temperatures just by way of having more um, less green space, more uh, concrete. And then we see um, the decision to use pesticides typically at a broad spectrum and they're um, going to affect the um, pollinators and others um, beneficials that uh, part of this non-targeted um, methodology. So last year, um, we started this project uh, through the USDA. It's a five-year program, and it's primarily geared towards targeting uh, undergraduates that are interested in this kind of research. It's through the REEU for the USDA. It's analogous to the National Science Foundation's REU program, if you're familiar. And so this one just hasn't been around as long. And the goal is to educate students in this field, to um, give them a project to work on that's going to be related to this field of interest, and also train them how to um, communicate this to uh, the community, right? How to be good at extension, because the USDA realizes that if you have scientists that are good in their field, they may not always, it may not always translate to being able to express that into the community. So those are our three points that we work on um, in our program. And so um, Dr. Harper and Dr. Ingwell have been really uh, instrumental in helping train our students, work alongside me and help oversee our project. And then I'm sort of the boots on the ground that make sure that they get, their, get it done and work alongside with me and, and help uh, meet our research goals. Now, our project objectives um, are these, and we're going to be assessing the insect pollinate, um, populations um, in within our um, urban uh, community gardens, we want to know who are our uh, pests, pests of interest, you know, who's out there. So we're doing a survey. And then we also want to know what, what other insects are there, what beneficials are there, what pollinators are there. So we're doing a survey um, on that level. And then we're also doing sort of intervention. We're adding pollinator gardens to um, a subset of those urban gardens. And we're looking at the interactions there. And there's many to be looked at, but we're primarily targeting the interaction between insect pollinators um, with, um, within that location. You know, do more come? Uh, does it change the richness, the abundance? Is there any interaction between insect pests and pollinators, which is a little bit more um, challenging to sort of uh, understand and not well understood, um, as well understood as it um, as we could. Um, so these are these are our big goals. Now, the first one and the one that we worked on this summer uh, is actively scouting all of our fields for the insect pests that are there, and we did this through uh, weekly um, counts, and uh, we primarily focused on cucurbit and Solanaceae, not because I'm a, I'm a cucurbit person, but it did help because I knew all the pests that they can have, um, as well as Solanaceae, which is something else I work on. But the reason why we went with those two is everybody had them in their gardens, right? We wanted to make sure that these would be ones we would see throughout the five years because we really can't tell the community gardeners what to plant, right? So we knew that in general, they would have these um, every year. And then we uh, took, took data and saved them and still analyzing. Then we use pitfall traps and sticky, sticky traps uh, to also do some assessment and see what the populations look like. Um, and in general, we did this pretty consecutively, uh, really to try and get an idea of what we have for the beginning population. Second is our assessment of our pollinators. And we 
did, we're essentially doing a couple things here. We're looking at what do all of our sites look like initially? You know, what are uh, what are the populations of pollinators to begin with? What does it look like over the season? Does it change? Um, and so we did several counts throughout the season. Ultimately, we'll be looking at um, uh, some bee, you know, native bees. We're also looking at butterflies, and ideally doing three to four assessments a year um, in the early, mid, and late season here, uh, and to be able to look at what changes over the season and who comes in, and um, certainly as it aligns with our pollinators, um, it aligns with the pollinators. Um, pollinator flowers are available at the time. So we're going to look over time to see that using um, transects and um, sweet netting uh, as our active. And uh, we try to split it up about five minutes on either the vegetable side or the pollinator side. <clears throat> and then we would uh, collect those samples. And then uh, plant traps or beebles, as well as pitfall traps would also be uh, sort of double dip to be able to see what do we have um, for our pollinators uh, in those as well. Okay. Our third objective um, is sort of evolving over time in that in the beginning, we were looking at everything, what, what insects are there in general, and then what um, is going to happen when we put in these pollinator gardens. So we know that there are strong support for this relationship between pollinator gardens and pollinators, right? We know that it's sort of this build it and they will come. Um, idea in the plant side is really the realm that I typically live in. And so we know um, this is a more mature pollinator garden that I put in um, prior to even starting this project. And we could see just visually and make some, some assessments there um, before we even got started to know that this would, this would work, right? Um, but we're not as clear on the relationship between pollinator gardens and what impact they have on the pressure of other um, insects, whether they're um, beneficial or pests. So when those start to interact, what does that look like? Um, and there's a lot of factors that go into that, the proximity um, of the gardens to each other, as far as the pollinator gardens versus the urban gardens and lots of other factors. Um, so we're still trying to work this out in London um, had this nice visual that we're still trying to work out some of those um, those details. And then ultimately they were looking at, and I'm also interested in, does it, does it change yield, right? We know that with less predation on our uh, crop, we're going to see an increase in yield. And um, if we're managing it in a way uh, that um, hopefully is beneficial to take out, you know, to reduce the pests and not uh, take out the beneficials in the pollinators, hopefully we have that in balance, we typically see a um, uh, benefit to the yield. Now, in Indiana, we know we have over 400 species of bees, many more present um, as native um, to the United States. Um, we know that bees, uh, native uh, honeybees are not native to the US. We do uh, tend to think about them as far as their role as a providing pollinator service to our um, plants that require uh, pollination. And when I was doing plant breeding, I used to call myself the bumble, the honeybee, right? Because I'm making those crosses with pollen all the time. But uh, we do rely on that for a lot of our um, specialty agricultural crops. And then we have butterflies and moths and all these other um, flies and wasps and ants and beetles that are also involved and provide um, pollinator services that when I tell my students about this, they're always so surprised that this flooding category exists because they don't always think about that. <laughs> but we know that all of these together are providing pollinator services both to our cultural and um, native species of plants. <clears throat> now, why do we go with pollinator plants? I just said that there's that natural connection, but there's a logistical and sort of um, theoretical reason why uh, we think that we can use pollinator plants uh, in uh, as, as pollinator attractors? Well, we know that native plants are typically that. They're native. They are established. They can establish well in, um, and they grow well in conditions that we would see here in the United States, here in Indiana. They typically are adapted to the climate. They are not uh, as likely to become a weedy um, problem and take over uh, an area or out compete. 
they require less water after the first year and <laughs> you gotta water them at first or they die. Um, and they're less likely to be weedy and will establish well and, and grow in and fill in. And ultimately that requires less on the part of the person that has that garden or that group. Um, interestingly, over the years of breeding, we know that um, some of our flowering plants do not produce pollen that is either they don't produce it at all or that pollen is sterile or they don't make nectar any longer. So these are not um, going to be, they might be flowering and beautiful, but they don't provide food to those pollinators. We also know that plants that are produced in mass can also carry um, residual pesticides and, and herbicides and things in the field um, or from production, which can be a problem. And we know that essentially where we're located, we're in sort of the path of the way that um, monarchs um, need for breeding. Particularly in Grant County, we have a uh, garden that is dedicated to um, the monarch. And we have people that rear monarchs in our area. They call themselves the monarch mamas. They were just, they were on TV a little while ago. People sometimes know about them, but they release monarchs um, quite a bit throughout the season. Actually, I think they even just released them as late as last week because the weather was so good. So <laughs> we'll look at these, um, but we know that we are at risk for decline. Uh, for, for, for many of these um, bee species, um, including the rusty patch bumblebee, um, which we do have record of being in, in the presence in, in Grant County. So our pollinator gardens are gonna look something like this. And you have to sort of think the long haul here, right? It takes a couple, two to three years for them to really fully establish. The upshot is that we have um, some plants that are not Seedlings. We have ones that we're able to separate and use that are already flowering. And so we have our eight sites. Four of them will have the pollinator gardens, and four will be our control. And so the students designed this garden based on a few factors. One is um, keeping it flowering all season, it's really important. Um, height differential, so that everything kind of crescendos in the middle, and, um, and color variability is also important. So those are all some features that the gardens have. Now, we got our plant material from different places. Some of it came as seeds. Some of it came from uh, a colleague of mine who is really dedicated to native pollinators and already had a bunch of plants. So we're able to make them split from her garden, from Scott and McCullough. And then um, we uh, were able to buy in some seedlings from a plant nursery in um, Riverview, which is up in Spongeville, which is near Fort Wayne. Um, and some of the seeds, when you buy them, they require a cold period. It's called cold stratification. You basically have to make them pretend it's winter. So they went through cold stratification and we're in the germination phase and perennials tend to take a bit to establish, but we're in like the this size phase and um, those can go out now. They should overwinter just fine. So um, that's a, uh, some of them will also be propagated throughout the season in our greenhouse. Now, this is just an overview, just to give you an idea of what um, pollinator plants and native forbs we are selecting from a much longer list. One of um, the fact sheets that um, came from Purdue is very helpful. Um, <clears throat> but we have a combination of flower colors, the flowering periods, the height, and who are they attracting, right? In general, we're seeing bees, some butterflies, moths, some wasps, and some of them particularly target um, are particularly important for certain species. I was, I had more detail on that, but for the sake of time, I'm um, gonna sort of move past that. But um, the idea is that we want to be able to encourage some of these um, more uh, even rare species to have habitat and have a place to um, uh, be able to get their, their food supply. So this is a snapshot. This isn't everybody that will be in our garden but um, some of the highlights, um, cup plant, uh, I'll just use common name uh, for now, but um, rattlesnake master, uh, different kinds of bee balm, our, um, our black eyed Susan, ironweed, full mouth sander, um, now I can't think of it, echinacea, but with a purple cauliflower, and then one of the two, but we're gonna have both of the milkweed. Now, of course there are others, 
that we could um, also include, and they're not off the list completely, but these are some other ones that we've found, um, you know, that we can add in. Um, but for now, uh, for different reasons, we're not. Now, we have established 20 by 10 uh, raised bed gardens. That was the direction we ended up going. Um, so as to make sure that they don't get mowed over um, because that happened to my pollinator garden the first year, it got mowed over. So, you know, um, people don't know that it looks like a weedy patch, but it's really not. So we put the wood inside, we hope that people won't mow over it. Um, so um, ultimately, this is the one that is, this is in third year and this is not part of the study, but just to give you an idea, it all fills in. Yes, this is not as diverse as what the ones that we're planning will look like, but that's the goal. So you can see we've got some perennials in there spotted around, okay? <clears throat> now, when we um, started to make our observations, we ended up with some conclusions now and we're still analyzing this data. So um, I'll have more to say as time goes along, but these are the major four um, bees that we saw um, in all of our flights the bumblebee, the honeybee, carpenter, and the green metallic sweat bee. Sorry, I did that, didn't I? Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, of course, we saw other pollinators that will also be cataloging and um, inventorying. Um, and then as far as what are the major insect pests that we found at um, our site uh, range from uh, Japanese beetle, which is pretty ubiquitous everywhere, squash vine borer, striped cucumber beetle, and squash bug in our um, cucurbit crops and emerald scarab and ground beetle. Um, we also saw other things that you couldn't easily pin like white fly um, and aphids. So just looking at the data that we have so far, and I'm actually gonna can I move this. All right. Just to give you a snapshot of what we saw over the summer um, through our analysis is that we found that Depending on what location we're at, we're obviously going to see a different diversity of pest insects. And of course, as the season went along, which I didn't show it that way, but you could see as the season went along, you could see a change in what's present. And then some things persist through the whole season, other things um, sort of have their moments and then um, fade away and then something else comes in uh, pretty consistently, which kind of surprised me because um, I guess I just wasn't aware that we had so much white fly. Like that seems really high everywhere. And I'm thinking maybe it has something to do with this very humid summer and we have plants that are densely packed together, but albeit the case that we had a lot, we didn't see a lot of like overt damage from that. Um, aphids, of course, some didn't have any at all. Um, others did and, um, and these are the green peach aphids are the ones that we're counting. We also saw other examples of aphids um, like a red aphid, and that was more in our um, native um, pollinator gardens, which is interesting. Now, <clears throat> other things, Japanese beetle hammered some and kind of left others alone. Cucumber beetle, um, we're talking about solanaceae, so I wouldn't expect to see too many. They, you might have seen one or two on these plants because, but that's not their major food supply, so we didn't really expect that. And now I have to go back this way because I used the mouse. All right, there we go. Now, in the cucurbitaceae crops, um, striped cucumber beetle, we didn't see as much as we would have expected. We planted late, and then we started looking for them late. And so we didn't see as much um, if we moved back. We didn't do a May, we did a June, July, and August. Um, so striped cucumber beetle were kind of phasing out. Um, squash vine borer um, was sort of dependent on what location you were at. Um, squash bug as well. Japanese beetles were not as big of an issue in uh, cucurbitaceae, um, aphids and white fly, yes, and some leaf hopper. Uh, so that's, that's a snapshot of what it looks like. And really what we wanted to know is not just like, um, we wanted to know who are all the players and then also um, how abundant they are and how it varies um, in each location. Now, um, along with that, it gave us the opportunity to be able to educate the community. And so of course with COVID, there were some restrictions. One of the things we could do is we had um, an extension workshop at our Alliance Gardens. And so we brought um, anybody that was participating in any of those eight sites to 
our gardens, showed them around, and then talked about, actually, I did very little talking for once, and my students did all of the informing of the different pollinators that we're looking at, the different paths, the point of our project, and then um, hosted and, and answered questions. Um, we had about 25 people come, which is a pretty good turnout for our area, and just a broad range of backgrounds and interests. Um, some of each of the community gardens has a garden manager, so they came, and then people that were growing in their um, garden could also come. Now, um, alongside that, one of the things that was really exciting um, was that these growers got to talk to each other and we got to sort of collaborate on, you know, this is my issue and that is their issue. Um, observations that we've made um, from our uh, sort of first year are, are several. One is that um, the background knowledge that our growers have on how to manage their past is um, fairly one note in that if there's an insect, they will spray a broad, a broad spectrum insecticide on it. Um, and some of them are spraying on a uh, schedule. So one of the things that was really challenging was though they knew they were a part of this, if they saw something, they just didn't make the connection that if I spray this, this will also interact with what we're trying to see. So there might be weeks where the pest levels look lower than you might think they should if you're not treating, but they were treating them. And so that was something that we have to work with them to help them understand why we're not going to do that or why we need to do that more carefully. Because it also affects the pollinators that are there, right? Um, over time. So that was an issue. The other thing that was exciting uh, was that we saw evidence of beneficial insects. I could see par parasitoid wasps, I could see um, horn, uh, tomato horn worms that had um, the parasitoids on the outside or the eggs on the outside um, in several of the gardens. Um, so that was really exciting. Um, and yet we <laughs> saw that in the garden, some of them are in basically grassy fields. And so what you're going to see for the abundance of pollinators is gonna look very different than if you're looking at um, other locations where there's even shrubbery around or anything that flowers. So we have to keep that in mind when we're trying to make our, um, our conclusions here and trying to understand why, um, why there's this abundance or not. But the benefit is that we've, we have our control, we, we have our control gardens where um, we're not changing anything about their gardens. And we have a nice combination of um, some that are in the grassy areas and some that are in um, more um, sort of perennials and other things around them. And then we have our other ones that have pollinators uh, and pollinator gardens um, that we will be uh, putting in. So uh, that is sort of the idea of our project. And I'll just say that one of the best outcomes that I've seen so far is the community has bought in. They're excited about this. And I've been getting calls from other people in the community asking, can we put a native pollinator garden in my, my patch? We were just gonna put grass seed and we we're just gonna mow down our vegetable garden that is not doing what we want. Can you, can you help us? So I feel gratified that this has been well received. The um, Marion Community Garden Association members have been really well receiving of this, even if they're not necessarily always abiding by all the things that we would help them um, to do, but uh, it's been uh, a good process so far. So these students work with me for um, eight weeks, and then these students are not all Indiana Wesleyan students. This is a nationally funded program, so I can bring in students from anywhere. So one of them came from Indiana Wesleyan and the other three from our other institutions. Um, as long as they're an undergraduate um, and interested in biology, or STEM, they can be part of the program. So it was really nice to have students that were not just from our institution um, engaging with us. So um, I, that's really what I have for you guys. And I can um, also say, you know, we have affiliations um, with Purdue and we also have um, funding through the USDA AFRI um, through NISA. And then of course, since we have bees, they had to learn some beekeeping. So we had some fun with that and uh, we're gonna hopefully have some honey this season. So I can take questions or any comments or any feedback that you have. Yes. Did you notice any 
yield their in regard with um in my two so i can speak to the two that i harvest in um in the in the patch that had the pollinator garden with the tomatoes i at least looked at that we did see an increase compared to the ones to the other garden that didn't now is that enough to say that, that is it a one-off just this season or a, you know is it contributing factor is something we're going to have to continue to look at but we are looking at those kinds of details when it even if it's on a sort of micro level, because we're not going to do it to all of them, all of our plots. But yeah, we did. Yeah. We saw some difference in the like Japanese beetles across uh, some of the different pests across all these places. Are you looking at like uh, the surrounding um, areas, maybe doing like impervious services versus like uh, crop fields or something like that? Are you guys going to look into that or is that a little outside the scope? Well, for this project, I think it'd be outside the scope. But I think really to answer the questions that we have, I think it might become part of the bigger scope, mm -hmm. kind of the program that I'm working in, there's room to be looking at those things. And so I'm open to sort of adjusting so that we can continue to look at those to help us answer the questions that we're asking here. Because there's really just not a lot of data. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Who's going to do the weeding? <laughs> well, <laughs> So at the um, pollinator gardens, there's four of them mercifully. And as time goes along, the weeds get sort of weeded out by the natives. Um, and we had um, some help, shall we say, that our very helpful Marion Community Garden Association members um, decided to use Roundup on our plots at the end of the season. So some of them were weeded by that, but the ones that weren't, I actually teach um, teach quite a lot of classes. Um, that's primarily what my appointment is. So I have commandeered my environmental science class to do the weeding for the semester, along with my research students. So yes, it's going to get done. Um, and then uh, at the vegetable garden level, the um, people that run their community gardens all have their strategy. And then I have um, several. I have two to five student um, interns in the summertime helping me manage my class. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier that uh, a lot of the people that use those gardens, they, they spray on schedule. Do you have like an initiative to have more of a like, unified approach for pest management, even like like planting, like fertilizer, planting bits, stuff like that? Is that something that you're looking to do in the future? Yeah. So it kind of goes back to the ethos of that organization and how it started its mission. And the person that is the president of the association was at the meeting where we talked about understanding that some of the garden managers are deciding to spray. And it was surprising to that person because the, the idea was not to do it, not to have inputs um, of that level. Obviously you want to have a crop survive, but there's other ways to do this. <clears throat> and so um, it, it was a nice sort of aha moment for everybody in that group to see, oh, there's more than one way to do this. And you know, the simple way isn't always the best way because there's a short-term gain for a long-term loss. And so um, I do think that that's gonna shift um, the change, at least I hope so. I can't always be out there seeing what they're doing, but the hope is that they're going to do it less yeah, as time goes along. And maybe not have to do as much pest control because maybe there is this interaction happening that is helping to suppress those populations. That's what we hope. Yeah. I was, um... Excited to hear that folks wanted pollinator gardens in their own patches, but that made me curious about what their motivations were. So, what what were the reasons that they approached you to to, to get pollinator gardens? Yeah, I was curious about that myself because I we've been at this for a short while now. Um, I think it was word of mouth that like they could see good things happening, and that uh, one of the uh, organizations is actually um, just had people that were interested in protecting pollinators apparently. And so they said, well, it's between mowing this down and putting in grass or do what you do, how about that? And so part of it is also building an infrastructure that allows us to be able to support that endeavor because we certainly want that to continue, but how to do that logistically is something we're working on. But it, it sounded like it was inherently they, were, they wanted to be able to have a green space that would also be um, beneficial to pollinators, so yeah. 
how much uh, maintenance do these attaches take? Like, is it just sort of like you put the, you, you aside from the greenhouse, we're hearing like put them in the ground to get them, or do they require regular maintenance? Yeah, so the first year, I mean, it kind of depends on where you're starting. You know, if you already have a patch that's already pretty well um, cleared and, you know, uh, uh, amended and all of that, um, just putting the plants in and making sure that they're properly watered is really what you have to do and keeping the weeds down in that first year. But really after that first year, years two, three, and, and going on, they require very little maintenance. You don't need to put irrigation in. You don't really need to do a lot of weeding. Um, they pretty much do their thing and they come back every year on their own. Um, usually by year three is when you see the kaleidoscope of colors if you've done it properly, where you have different phases of the summer with different flowers um, opening at different times. And really kind of what inspired me to, was I saw this at University of New Hampshire when I came back to visit. Somebody on our farm had been doing this and I was seeing it when it was in year five. And so you could really see just, and they just said, don't worry if it looks bad the first couple of years, because it probably will. But over, over time, the maintenance gets less and the benefit is that it pretty much takes care of itself. Yes. Uh, so just piggybacking off that. So for the pollinator patches, and you have that uh, diagram of like the colors and the heights, how true does that stay throughout the season? Or do you have like one species that eventually takes over in like year three or year four? No, it's it's going to always be that sort of cycle of color throughout the season. Yeah. Um, obviously, if you have more of one plant, it's going to probably be more of that color for, for extension of the season. But in general, you'll have some in the beginning that will be white or blue and others that will be yellow and other shades of yellow and kind of going on from there. Yeah. Thinking about establishment over the years, how far out are you forecasting um, these pollinator patches going? Because I know after six, seven, eight years, you see a pretty steady decline mm -hmm. with the plant regeneration. Yeah, so while this project is really kind of five years, I see this as just the start of, of this. And so I would expect that we would need to start in year, year four adding new plants in there. And we know that this is true because we have a rain garden near our campus. I think you were there for that. Um, that was established four years ago. And what's happening is thistle is starting to come in and take it out. So there we called out all the thistle and we're starting to reseed. So yeah, after about four or five years, yeah, you start having to need to rejuvenate it. Yeah. Once it's there, it's pretty well under its own muscle. Anything else? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.